The Denver Center for the Performing Arts Off Center and the Museum of Contemporary Art Denver present Mixed Taste, Still at Home, Virtual Tag Team Lectures about Unrelated Topics. And now, introducing tonight's unlikely pairing, 100-Year Starship and Cattle Breeding. And here are your hosts, Sarah Bai and Charlie Miller. Hi, everyone. I'm Charlie Miller, Off-Center Curator at the Denver Center for the Performing Arts. And I'm Sarah Bai, the Director of Programming at the Museum of Contemporary Arts, Denver. Welcome to Mixed Taste, Still at Home. We are coming to you live from our homes. Our guests are in their homes. And we're glad that you are tuning in from your home. In case you don't know, Off Center produces unexpected theatrical experiences. And MCA Denver is a contemporary art museum in Denver. And this is our final week of our mini series to get us through the winter. We are so glad that you are here to join us. We are coming to you live tonight and we'd love for you to participate in the live chat as we go. You can comment throughout, play a game, ask questions of the speakers, and even win a prize at the end of the show but you need to log in or create a channel as YouTube calls it before you can comment. So click on the say something box at the bottom of the live chat area to get started. Now, if you're watching this from a TV, commenting is complicated and you're better off just participating from a computer or a tablet or your phone. To get the conversation going, here's our question for you tonight. What is your favorite planet? Type it in the comment box and we'll show you how it works. It looks like people are already checking in from where they're watching from. Sarah. What is your favorite planet? I'm gonna go with Earth because we live here. Very nice. Very nice. And what's your favorite planet, Charlie? Um, can I give the middle school answer? <laughs> I would expect nothing less. <laughs> Pluto, because Pluto <laughs> was a planet when I was in middle school. And uh, um, that was I expecting you to say, uh, but that that's great. I, I'm glad I'm glad you love Pluto. Uh, we're getting some Venuses, some Saturns. We got a Uranus. There we go. Uh, we also got Planet Hollywood. That's nice. Uh, mm. I was not expecting that either. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Tatooine, of course. Yeah, Mars. It's a red planet. Also a good choice. Titan, not a planet, but an exoplanet. I think that counts. I don't yeah. know. We'll take it. Take yeah, it. Maybe so. All right. Well, you are clearly getting the hang of how the commenting works and mixed taste. We'll tell you a little bit about it now. It's a mashup series where we bring together two experts who each present on different topics. And then we have a live question and answer on both topics at, at the, the same, same time. time. The rules right. are very simple. The first speaker talks for 20 minutes. Then the second will speak on a completely unrelated topic for 20 minutes. During the first part of the program, no connections are allowed to be made between the two topics but during the Q&A, anything can happen. And between the talks tonight, we're gonna play a quick game. And then at the end of the evening, a Denver poet will perform an original poem inspired by what we learned together here tonight. Our topics for this evening are the 100 year starship and cattle breeding. So let's introduce our first speaker who's going to be presenting on the 100 year starship. Alira Zalman founded the Deep Space Predictive Research Group to push the boundaries of social science and behavioral technologies to be used in space mission planning. She leads an international research team whose goal it is to create new behavioral technology to support this mission. As a co-author of the award-winning response to the DARPA NASA RFP for the 100-year Starship Project, Aliras focuses her contributions on the psychological impacts of long-term space travel. Please welcome Aliras Alman. Hi, hello everybody. Thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. And I am so excited to be part of Mixed Taste this year. And I hope that you all are ready to go on this journey with me. As she said, my name is Lyris Allman and I consider myself a champion of space exploration, deep space exploration. And I'm here to take you, to talk to you about a lifetime's journey to the stars, a journey that not only takes my lifetime, but the lifetime of generations. What I'm here to talk about is the journey of the 100 year Starship Project. So as a member of the 100 Year Starship Grant team, we won a competitive grant from DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, to continue the mission of 100 Year Starship, which they started. 
which is to enable the capabilities to mount a human exploration mission to another star. So it's an inclusive, an inclusive audacious journey transforms life here on earth and beyond. This was the vision of Dr. Mae Jemison, who is the principal of 100 Year Starship. It is her vision that guided us in that grant and continues to guide us as she is the leader of the 100 Year Starship Project. To prepare for the interstellar journey within the next 100 years, Dr. Jemison felt that the inclusivity was a success of the project, a project at this scale. People didn't lose interest. They were just left out of the equation, out of the conversation. It's about a movement of science, exploration, and wonder. And who participates makes all the difference in the world. So one of the things that was done as part of 100 Year Starship was creating this video, our 100 YSS manifesto. And I'll let Dr. Jemison tell you all about it. From the first moments of human history, we have gazed in awe at the infinite sweep of the heavens. The stars formed our creation myths and cultures. The stars have witnessed every human achievement and each foible that has set us back. And they're still up there, waiting for us to advance enough to reach them. Once, we relied on the stars to navigate the Earth. Now, we're leaving the Earth to navigate the stars. Humanity and our planet stand at an inflection point. Will we continue on our current path of short-term thinking, a path that appears safe but flirts with stagnation? Or do we come together and push for humanity's next giant leap forward? At 100 Year Starship, we are calling on members of our generations to complete a clear mission. Make the capabilities for human travel to another star a reality within the next 100 years. Because just as past exploration pushed breakthroughs in agriculture, communications, energy, transportation, materials, and medicine, the greatest rewards of interstellar travel will be felt here at home. We believe that pursuing an extraordinary tomorrow will create a better world today. And who participates makes all the difference. Join us on this audacious journey. The road to another sun won't be easy, but if it were, we wouldn't grow. No matter how hard things have gotten, no matter how dark, humans have never failed to look up. Up for inspiration, up for endless possibilities. With a humble craft hurtling toward a distant star, built by the best hearts, minds, and hands, we'll discover a better version of ourselves and bring a brighter, more harmonious, more sustainable life to the future generations who will call our beautiful their home. So every time I see that, I just get re-inspired about the mission of 100 Year Starship and what the, the, the program is trying to do. So one thing I want to talk about before we move on is understanding, I don't know if you heard that when we go and the reason that we're doing this particular project, yes, it's to satisfy our um, interest of going into outer space, but it's also to enhance life here on earth. And when we look for things and look for solutions that are enable us to go into space, we enhance life here on earth. So we're gonna hear about that as we go forward. But before then, I wanna talk a little bit about our logo. If you see it says 100 year starship and then Canopus 310 LY. So that is, Canopus is the name of a star and 310 LY is 310 light years away from earth. Canopus was the brightest star in the Southern hemisphere. And in ancient times, Egyptians and Chinese used that as, way, as um, a guide for planting their fields. But one of the things you heard, it's about an inclusive journey and we're trying to make space accessible. So if you ever go to our website on 100 Year Starship, you will see in the corner a, um, a little star on the top left corner and it'll have the name of a star and the distance from the earth. And no matter wh where you are and based on the time and where you are on the earth, that star will change. So if you have a friend in India or a friend here in the United States, when they log on at the same time, they should have different stars because their position over Earth, um, in, on Earth is different relative to the stars. It's all about finding ways to make the space 
accessible to everyone. And that's part of the 100 Year Starship mission is bringing everyone to the table to talk about this audacious journey. So who participates in 100 Year Starship? Um, while the organization itself, the core is about 10 to 15 people, we have a full extensive network of international researchers, scientists, policymakers, artists, writers from all over the world, and people, just plain everyday people who are part, who are interested, who bring their perspectives. And one of the things I wanna tell you about is the story of one of our researchers, the story of Dr. Carl Aspeland. And he is a professor at the University of Rhode Island. And he really exemplifies bringing different people to the table who normally we would not think would be at the table when it comes to space exploration. So Dr. Aspeland came on stage, <coughs> excuse me, at our first symposium. And he asked the question, what are you gonna do about clothing? And first of all, I know someone said it. I know it's in the chat. You said, go naked. That is not the answer. We need clothes. We need to protect ourselves. So going naked is not the answer, but we have to look at the impact of clothing. How do you make it? If you're on a ship for the rest of your life, you can't go to a mall, you can't store it. What do you do about clothing and maintaining it and maintaining the, um, the cleanliness around clothing, um, the, the, social, the social impact of clothing, and then what it means and status and things like that. So something as simple as that gets very complicated. And that's what we're here to do is solve some of those complicated problems. And of course you need engineers because we need to build a vehicle. And actually that's part of the easy part is building the vehicle. It's everything else, which we'll talk about that makes things complicated. So let me give you a little bit of basics about space first. We have to decide where are we gonna go? There are 100 to 400 billion stars in the Milky Way. Many of those stars have planets around them. And then there are 100 million galaxies just like the Milky Way. So you can imagine that the number of possible destinations are many and they're vast and they're at all distances. But really, we're just gonna go next door to our nearest star, Proxima Centauri, and it has a planet that's orbiting it that's in what we call the Goldilocks zone, which means it's an Earth-like planet, Proxima b. So that's our closest destination, and it's the nearest star to us. And if you said that's the sun, we know that too. Um, the distance is 4.3 light years away. That is, you know, kind of close, relatively speaking. If I talk to you about all those other stars in the distance, this one is close, it's 4.3 light years away, which are, it's only 24 trillion miles, 40 trillion kilometers from Earth. And guess what? It takes a long time to get there. That's 70,000 years given our current technology. As you heard, we're here to enable, to move the needle forward to discover the technologies that are gonna move us faster. So current, just as an example, Voyager um, was launched 36 years ago, 37, 38 years ago. And it took it 36 years to reach the edge of our solar system. And when we have an edge in space, that is the place where the gravitational pull of our sun no longer brings um, bodies into its orbit. And Vo um, Voyager was going 35,700 miles per hour or 55,844 kilometers per hour, 36 years. And it's got a long way to go before it gets an Proxima Centauri. And the real important part is that's our first foray into interstellar space. So we've touched it, we're not there, but we're gonna get there. And the other part of the um, DARPA directive is that we have to take humans. So we can cheat and say that, yeah, we're at, we're um, in interstellar space, but there are no humans as humans we're explorers, we want to be there. As I like to say, we want the selfie, not the postcard. So that's what we're here to do is help humans get that selfie. So let's talk about what the short list is for human survival. And I'm gonna, you can imagine the list is huge. There's a lot of things that we have to do. So the first thing that we wanna solve is artificial gravity. We watch science fiction movies, everybody's walking like we're walking on Earth. That's because it's filmed on Earth. But in reality, we don't have gravity. That picture you see is an astronaut 
obviously upside down performing CPR because there's not enough gravitational pull and not enough pressure for that person to perform CPR and get enough pressure to do a compression. So you have to practice, you know, as you know, astronaut is maybe some Cirque du Soleil training in order to be an astronaut and perform CPR if necessary. The other thing is that sex would be challenging. If we're going on an interstellar journey, we have to make sure that the population continues and have some entertainment. But I won't go into detail on that. Just know that artificial gravity is necessary for everyone's benefit. We also need to figure out a way to go faster. How do we go faster than that 35,000 miles per hour to get to our destination faster so the people have a chance to live? If they're going to live on the ship, they don't have to live as long. We don't have to have as many generations if we do a multi-generational ship. We also need to talk about long-distance communication systems. You've heard when we had the Mars rover landing, the seven, seven, <laughs> the seven minutes of high stress from going from orbit to the planet's surface, what we find out is that there is an 11 minute delay from Mars to back to Earth. If something happens, we're not gonna know and what's happened has already happened. So we wanna find ways to have shorter distance and communications and then voice communication takes about 40 minutes round trip. So, um, you know, you, you say one thing, it takes 20 minutes to get to Earth and then 20 minutes back. When we go shorter, longer distance, it's gonna be even worse. If you saw the movie Passengers, Passenger woke up, sent a message, it takes 17 years to get back from where they were and 36 years to get a communication back. So you can't just say hi when you, when you have communication lags like that. We also need closed loop food systems. How are we gonna feed ourselves? What kind of food can you grow? What kind of food is healthy? What kind of food is nutritious? What also kind of food is not just for our nutrition, there, is rich, there are rituals around food that we like to have that make us feel human. So we wanna keep those systems available for, um, for the health of the individuals, not only our physical health, which is the next one, but also our emotional health, which is where I look at. We know people are gonna struggle when we go. If you saw the movie Ad Astra, you know what I'm talking about, but there's a lot of, um, maintenance that needs to happen and awareness when we're on these long-term journeys. And as you heard, the people who are going are going for the rest of their lives. They're never going to see Earth again. The people who are born on that ship in a multi-generational scenario, they're going to live and die on that ship. So how do you make life livable beyond just survival? So it's all those countermeasures that are needed for human health and for mental health. And again, you've heard when um, the astronauts are jogging and making sure that they, you know, keep their muscles because muscles atrophy, another asset of needing gravity because you don't want your muscles to atrophy. And how many hundreds of millions of miles can you continue to jog if we're on this interstellar journey? So those are some of the top things, the areas that we need to really focus on in order to make this journey um, viable. So next we wanna talk about, we have the body surviving, but how about the society? What does society look like on a ship that has no connection beyond really the second generation? Again, speaking of a multi-generational ship, what does that look like? So one, we think about what does trade look like? How do we exchange goods and services? What is money? You can be a billionaire on earth, but when you get into space, that means nothing because you can't fulfill any promises or pay. It's all about your own personal sweat equity and knowledge and skills that become the currency. Now talk about education. What are you educating people on? How do they learn? Those second and third generations, what is gonna be valuable for them to learn as they go? And what does an educational system look like? When we, in looking at 100 year starship and a ship, a multi-generational ship, we're thinking about 1200 people who would be going to maintain genetic diversity and variety. <coughs> so we also wanna think you have 1200 people, what does law and order look like? Who makes the laws? What are those laws? How, what's a law on earth based on earth conditions may change when you're in space because your decision framework is gonna change. You can't look at the conditions 
and the rules and mores of Earth applying into space because one, do, does Earth have jurisdiction on that on that ship? The and we say Earth is Earth. Um, are the people of Earth in agreement enough to say Earth has jurisdiction? We have people from different countries. We just don't know what that law and order and that decision framework will look like, which goes into religious practices. Religion is a part of the human experience. What is that going to, how is that going to impact who goes, who wants to go, surviving and engaging the whole spiritual experience when you are up in what we consider from earth, the heavens. And so if you heard uh, the first mixed taste and listening to some of my colleagues at the Islas School of Theology, the Artificial, Institute, um, Artificial Intelligence Institute, they had machine theology. Is that what's gonna work? We feed in all the knowledge of all the theologians and religious leaders and send that on the ship and what happens? Who's gonna pick up what? What if someone's an atheist? Do they evolve? We have no control. It's like letting go of control of everything that we have thought about when we put um, when we go on the ship. We want to plant the seeds of the best of who we are. And speaking of planting seeds, talk about family planning. What is that going to look like? Um, really, if we have to make sure that we want to keep our numbers up, we want to have genetic diversity. How do we ensure that? our species, because we are a species, continues. Um, how do we, is it going to be women giving birth? And as we know, even on earth, not every woman is capable of giving birth. So those who can, will they? Do we allow free will for the good? <laughs> or do we allow, or do we make those individuals, those women really, um, do we make those women produce children for the good of society? for the good of maintaining all of the, the health of that colony of 1200. So we have to think about free will. Is that even gonna be allowed for the survival of those people? And then finally, managing death. Death is part of life. It's the end. We go back to the religious practices. If your religious practice says we must honor the dead in a certain kind of way where we honor the body? Is that gonna be practical, keeping dead bodies on a ship? Or do we jettison them out? But you know, just kind of a waste of resources. You know, we put resources into that body. How do we get kind of like, not to be crass, return on our investment? Or <laughs> look at it more of that you're continuing to serve the people on the ship and the survival of the ship. But these are considerations that we have to manage, plan for, and plant the seeds for. Because ultimately, there is we have no control over what happens and what the people on the ship are going to experience and what they have to do to survive. Now, I've been talking about what's going to happen in the future, not having control, where are we going. But we still have milestones here in our lifetime that we will get to see. Um, we've seen the Mars rovers landing, which is awesome. There are four countries that have vehicles either orbiting. Uh, the United States is on Mars. We have the International Space Station, which is a milestone of having a space laboratory, an international cooperation space laboratory orbiting the Earth. We have the Artemis mission. Artemis, does anyone know, is the twin sister of Apollo, which means the United States, our Artemis mission is going back to the moon. They said boots on the moon, but really it's boots and stilettos because we wanna have the first woman and another man to land on the moon. The Artemis Accords is another universal agreement. Well, not universal. Nine countries have signed it, more joining all the time, but it's an agreement to use space in a civil manner. So we're now talking politics. Even here on Earth, we are setting the foundation for agreement and becoming that Earth, um, the Federation, or being part of the Federation and bringing the Earth for you Star Trek fans. Um, and also the Moon Village. The Moon Village is 
recognized by the UN as an entity going forward. You know, talk, I'm gonna go back to the Artemis Accords. That picture that you see is the day that the Artemis Accords were signed that's taken from my computer. So even in a virtual world, we are really trying to move this space exploration forward. And then the viability of commercial space being more than part of the supply chain for a government nation state. Commercial space endeavors have shown that they can do the work of the government. You've heard of SpaceX going back and forth, you um, delivering supplies, Blue Origin is coming in doing the same. So they're gonna be basically creating this infrastructure of delivery between earth and the moon. And also uh, Virgin Galactic, this is commercial space in tourism. So that's happening and that's just down the street in New Mexico, but I can't, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about commercial space and talk about Colorado. I'm the chair of the Colorado Space Business Roundtable. And if you did not know, Colorado is number one in aerospace employment per capita. So a lot of the things, the, the, um, the milestones that I've just talked about are being built here or supported by businesses in Colorado. You have Lockheed Martin who they are building the vehicle that is gonna take people to Mars. We've sent vehicles, we're taking people to Mars 2023, which is two years away. No, I think it's 2025, sorry. But still it's close in space terms that we're sending people. And that vehicle is built, being built right here at Lockheed Martin in Littleton. We have Astroscale is a new company here that's cleaning up all the debris around the earth so we can have clear flight paths. Um, about 10 years ago, there were only about 20,000 or 2,000 satellites and other um, things, I'll just say things in the orbiting earth. Now it's about 20,000. And if you've heard stories of the International Space Station, part of their job is just getting the space station out of harm's way of all this flying debris. And that company is about space sweeping. We have Sierra Nevada here, we have Ball Aerospace. So we have quite the ecosystem here in Colorado and here um, ready to support commercial space. And these are the things that will enable the capabilities for interstellar space flight. Once we can get a system of not just one government, but commercially, you know, when we have the post office, now we have FedEx, we have DHL, we have um, UPS, that's what's emerging in creating that infrastructure that is gonna allow us to make strides going forward and prepare us to go to interstellar human spaceflight. So in order to do that, we have to be inspired. And one of the things I like to do is make some recommendations of books and TV. At 100 Year Starship, we have made it a very deliberate point of bringing authors, science fiction authors and speculative authors to talk about what they see in the future, how they see interstellar, they play it out. And we invite them to our symposia. Our symposia is open to the public. It's really getting the public into and accessing all the different aspects of the science and um, the thought process and the thought leadership in doing this, this endeavor of a hundred year starship. And so we also invite authors who share with us our ideas challenge us, but they also learn from the scientists so that when they write, they have the science right. It makes it believable and more engaging. And these are a few of the books um, that, or all of these authors we've had or have asked to engage with a hundred year starship in some way. And they have brought a whole perspective. Onlyest is about an individual on a ship, on a multi-generational ship. What happens when you're the only one? Aurora by Kim Stanley Robinson talks about how a multi-generational ship happens and what the society and the individuals in that, because when you get to the second or third generation, they're kind of removed from the passion of that original group. And they may very well die on that ship. You're gonna have generations that will live and die on the ship and never reach the destination. What is it that's gonna um, propel them to stay in that, in that passion and not uh, die by suicide or anything like that. So it's really interesting to see how authors think about the future. And these other books are like that too. And the movies, my favorite, I'm gonna just talk about a couple of them, is Aniara, 
that is a Swiss science fiction movie. And there's all kinds of societal issues. But what fascinated me about that movie is how the hardware survived. It's about a cruise ship going from Earth to Mars. It was supposed to be a three week journey. Sound familiar? It's about a two day journey. Anyway, I know you guys know what I'm talking about. But um, what happened, it, it gets derailed. But a generation later, the ship, the outside of the ship is still pristine, which tells me how our metals will survive, how the ship will survive, but the people in it are a different story. Interstellar is the best way to, um, is the best example of um, Einstein's theory of relativity. In one part of the movie, one crew goes down to the surface, they're there for 40 minutes. The crew that's orbiting, orbiting the, the planet, that same planet, they're in it for 21 years. And it's like, oh, that's what's gonna happen. So as we're trying to have faster than light propulsion or close to that, that ship may experience a 10,000 year journey, but 70,000 years still would have gone by on earth. And so how do we keep that connection between who's going, who's staying, who knows who you are when you go, um, what's gonna evolve on earth, who gets to go, who stays, what's the impact of people who stay. There's all kinds of information and experiences that we have to learn and understand when we talk about 100 year starship. So I wanna leave you with the motto of 100 year starship. And it really is about not leaving earth. It's about being a part of a journey of humanity. It's about making sure that even though we're pursuing something greater, it's about making life here on earth here today bigger. So the first leg of a hundred year starship is really to lay the groundwork and the direction for discovery that is needed. We don't have the hundred year starship. We don't have the blueprint or the roadmap, but we have the passion to move the line forward understanding and curating and cultivating what's necessary to make the next step in our exploration of reality. This quote of we believe in pursuing an extraordinary tomorrow will create a better world today is really what it's all about. Like the travelers who will journey, the 100 year starship team will not see the goal, but those who live will have not seen the beginning. It's all in service to, human in service to humanity, a lifetime of a journey. Thank you. I think I just got my mind blown. Thank you so much, Aliras. Yes, and uh, there was a lot of great questions and, and comments in the chat. Hold on to those questions and, and we'll have the Q&A at the end. Uh, so hold on to them and put them in the chat a little bit later. And now... It's intermission time, folks. We're gonna play a little game that we like to call microfilm. <laughs> okay, here's how it works. We're gonna share a name, and you have to guess if this is the name of the of an award-winning microbrew or the name of an independent film. That's right. Did this did this uh, win a medal at the 2020 Great American Beer Fest, or was it in the 2021 film Sundance Film Festival lineup? So another. So Amazing game from the mind of Sarah Bai. We invite you to play from home and type your guess for each answer in the chat. And we're excited to welcome tonight's poet to join us to play live, Susie Q. Smith. Welcome, Susie. I hope you're ready. All right, uh, let's begin. We are gonna bring up the first slide and Susie, you have to guess if this is the name of a beer or the name of a film, the many lives of our lives, beer or film. So, um... You know, I I feel like because of like the days of our lives, that was that soap opera that used to come on. Maybe it still does. I'm not really yeah, sure. Yeah, I used to watch that with my granny. <laughs> I, I feel like, yeah, my grandparents were also into it. So I feel like there was the days of our lives. But there was also, I feel like, you know, brewing takes a long time, right? So it probably takes the many lives of our lives. So I'm going to go with the, I'm going micro brew. And it's a... You're correct. It's a microbrew. This was the gold medal winner for the fruited wood and barrel aged sour beer from a, a brewery in Long Island City, New York. How do you like that? It's a, we're about 50-50 from the audience there. I'm... I'm... 
Uh-oh. Uh, Susie well, cried. Yeah, well, hopefully she comes back. Uh, the next one is Inner Light. Is this a beer or a film? Susie, are you with us? She's frozen with a wonderful smile on her face. Well, that's good. It's better than being frozen with a weird look on your face, which is what usually happens to me. Uh, <laughs> So we're going to play with the audience. Beer or film? People are saying film. Susan Dowdy says film. Judy Chavez says film. Melanie Colotti says beer. Charlie, right. what is the answer? It is a beer. Uh, and this beer is actually from our mutual friend brewing in Denver, Colorado. Uh, it was the bronze medal winner for the IPA at the Great American Beer Festival 2020. So you can actually drink this beer. Probably you can buy it at the Argonaut, but we're not getting paid to say that. So, I mean, a liquor store near you. All right. The next one is Rebel Hearts. Is this a beer or a film? Russ Jackson says that he should always know the right answer is beer. I mean, and that may be true, but is Rebel Hearts a beer? We've got Mark Kettle says film. Susan Downey sells film. Charlie, do you think yeah. it's a beer or a film? Well, I know the answer is a film. Rebel Hearts was a documentary from the United States about a group of pioneering nuns who bravely stand up to the Catholic Church patriarchy fighting for their livelihoods. Um, so there you have it. It would also be a delicious beer, I think. <laughs> Ready for the next? I think so. <laughs> Mabel, my beauty. Is this a beer or a film? Oh, and I just got a text from Susie who said she's restarting. So hopefully she'll be back with us before the game's over. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. All right, beer or film? KM and NW says it's a beer. Betsy Rubner says beer. These are all good guesses. Oh, I mean, beer about film, Kit Baker. A, a beer about a film, is that what they said? Or a film about a beer. Or a film about a beer, it could be. Uh, right. So is Mabel, My Beauty, a beer or a film, Charlie? It is a film. It's a French film about a surprise reunion in Southern France that reignites passions and jealousies between two women who were for formerly polyamorous lovers. It sounds dramatic. It is. Uh -huh. All right, next up. Taming the Garden. Is that a beer or a film? A filmy beer. <laughs> this is a good one. Uh, Maybe so. Yeah, Taming we're, the we're stumping more people than the Swordfish game last week. I know, apparently swordfish was too easy. I think maybe we just don't know enough about swords or fishes and we thought it was hard, but actually everyone else is <laughs> like fully versed on both. All uh, right, ready for the answer? I think so. Amy Amy the oh, Susie's back. Woohoo! Back, sorry about that. That was, that was also dramatic. Uh, Taming the Garden, Susie, beer or film? Beer. Film. Okay. Oh, <laughs> this is a documentary from the Republic of Georgia, um, a poetic ode to the rivalry between men and nature. Fair. All right, we've got two to go, Susie. Okay. You ready? I'm ready. Devil's Pass. Devil's is this Pass. a beer or a film? I'm kind of on a streak. I'm going beer every time. I feel like it could work as either. I'm I'm going, we're going to go microbrew. Devil's Path. Devil's Path. Is it a... <sighs> yeah. You're right. It is a bronze medal winner for the Strong Red Ale from El Segundo Brewing Company in California. You know, I think it's actually good that Susie uh, cut out for a little bit because you would have probably got every single one of these right. And then Charlie and I would feel bad about ourselves for not knowing whether these were beers or films. Uh, we got one left tonight, though. So yeah. you still have an opportunity to get one wrong. Mountain Cat. Is that a beer or a film? Okay. You know, I... I think because I would like to see it, I, I, I'm gonna go film. Is that your final answer? Yes. All right. You're right. She's Mountain very good. Cat. Okay. Um, I love to see the film called Mountain Cat. This is a Mongolian film that was in the film, the short films competition about a troubled girl who is coerced into seeing a shaman. Uh, so that sounds pretty cool. All right. Well, thank you for your help, Susie. Uh, you're very good at this game, and we look forward to, to hearing your poem, which you are also very good at after the Q&A. And, and now, on with the show. On with the show, I'd like to introduce our next guest who will be teaching us about cattle breeding. Mark Enns grew up working on his family's fourth generation wheat and cattle operation in Northwest Oklahoma. As a visiting scientist for Landcorp Farming Limited in New Zealand, 
He developed genetic improvement programs for beef cattle, deer, sheep, and goats. Now, as a professor of animal breeding at Colorado State University, he teaches graduate and undergraduate students and has an active research program focus, focused on genetic evaluation and improvement of livestock. Please welcome Mark Enns. Thank you, Charlie, and hello, everybody. Uh, what a what a great evening and and what an enthralling talk and presentation from Alira's. I can't wait to see where uh, the evening ends up. Uh, you know when I when I when I speak to people not involved in the in the cattle industry, often I get the question, "How in the world did you end up being interested in studying cattle breeding?" Well, that's an interesting question. As Charlie alluded to, I grew up working on our family farm in in Northwest Oklahoma, and, and during my formative years, I, I learned to love agriculture. Uh, I, I learned to love livestock and animals in general. And so the natural thing you want to do when that's the case is you want to go become a, a veterinarian. But as I tried to further my education, I became interested in genetics. And having grown up on the farm and uh, one of, one of our, our, our livestock efforts was to purchase younger calves and put them on wheat let them graze and then sell them later on and, and uh, for higher value because they gained wheat gra or gained weight uh, grazing the wheat. And then we could still cut the wheat for grain. But during those, those times, often cattle would get sick. And, uh, and like many of you who are pet owners, you've had pets get sick. Uh, occasionally we lose those. My interest in livestock and agriculture and genetics brought me to the idea and, and to pursue a career where can we actually selectively mate the right animals so that we have a next generation of animals that are better than what we have now. So maybe we could reduce the number of animals that get sick out on the range, or maybe we can uh, uh, make them produce something that's more uh, desired by our consumer. But that's what really got me into cattle breeding. And so ultimately, when we think about cattle breeding, we're thinking about Who's going to create the next generation of animals? Which bull or which sire are we going to choose to mate to which cow or which uh, which female, which dam? And so that's really what I do at CSU. Now, you're going to have to bear with me because I do teach both graduate and undergraduate students. So I, I, I like to deal with data and sometimes we get lost in the data. But I, what I would like to do is is just use this to to. Uh, uh, give you the big picture, if you will. And so I borrowed a couple photos from, from the archives of, of my dear friend and fellow animal breeder, Dr. Scott Newman. And if you look at the top picture, that was uh, at a show in the mid 1940s. And if you look at the bottom picture, that was at a uh, particular livestock show uh, about 40 years later. And you can see just by looking at where the people's faces are and where the animal is in relationship to those that we've changed those animals over time. Just by selecting the right animals or what we think are the right animals to produce the next generation. And if you look at this chart, really what, what I want to show you is, is these are things that we measure in beef cattle. And, and this is from an organization that we do a lot of work with, but really I want you to, to focus on not what the individual bars mean, Okay. But how things have changed over time. We're here in 1954 when this association was formed. Here's the genetic level. We have ways of tracing or tracking uh, the genetic merit, if you will, of individuals and the genetics and how they contribute to the way those animals perform or grow. And we can track those all the way out to 2020. And this is what we would call a genetic trend, a genetic change over time. But that's really illustrated in that picture to the left and how much we've changed animals over time. Okay. So if you think about that, that's not only true in just the beef animals, but that's true even more recently in, in dairy animals in the U.S., where in the last uh, uh, nine years, we've increased production in, in dip per animal per dairy cow by about 11 percent over the 10 year period. And while many would say, well, yeah, that's because we've done a number of things which are true. We've improved animal health care. We've improved the way we uh, nutritionally manage animals. The, the diets are specifically tailored to those animals. But also, if you look at how genetics have changed over time, and here what we've done is taking, taking the, the Holsteins, right, the, the black and white 
breed that you see driving down the road at, at dairies and tracked what has happened with the animal's genetic value or genetic merit, the genes that they're expressing relative to milk production over time. And you can see that we've part of that contribution for increased milk production is due to the way we've selected animals and the animals we've chosen to actually produce the next generation. Okay. And so a lot of that historically has been based on pedigree. And many of our pedigrees, as you're going to see, go back many generations. And so I just pulled uh, an example off. So this is a particular sire that's available, uh, is registered in one of the, the groups that we work with, one of the breed associations. And the way you read a livestock pedigree is here's the individual of interest. And then on the, on the, the, the upper side is always the sire, the next bars, and then the dam. And then we can go to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation of individuals. And ultimately we can determine how related is the mother of the great, great grandsire to this individual. And in, these, in this information that we've tracked over time, we're able to determine which animals genetically should be the best relative to who we select to produce the next generation. And there's a lot of science behind that selection. And as I've alluded to in the previous slide, we have pedigree information where we've uh, uh, tracked individuals. And some of those pedigrees can be tracked back over 100 years. In concordance with that, or in addition to, I should say, we often take measures on individuals. Uh, so a typical thing we would do for many of our uh, uh, animals, our, our producers driving uh, genetic selection and genetic improvement, we would measure birth weight. We would measure what the animal weighs uh, when it's weaned from its mother at about seven months of age, and then maybe what the weight is at, at a year of age. And then we also look at well, what is the size of the animal at maturity. So in cattle, maturity is at about five years of age. They typically don't grow larger after five years of age. Or maybe we're interested in measuring fat deposition or milk production. And increasingly we use ultrasound technology to look at how much muscling does an animal have and maybe how much fat has it deposited or intermuscular fat. And then ultimately we're interested in the level of competition when we measure those animals. So if you think about this, uh, you know, in, in normal years, we're coming into the track and field season. Uh, uh, like I said, my day job is at Colorado state university and we'd be entering that and, and, uh, Winning a regional event, right, doesn't mean as much or the level of competition likely isn't as high as if you won in that same event in the Olympics. We, that same situation occurs in cattle breeding. Some breeders are really at the top of the genetics and others not so high. And so doing well in one of those herds or one of those uh, ranches uh, may not mean the same if you're in an elite competition or in a not so elite competition. Or maybe for those of you in Colorado, you know, uh, we don't play 1A football teams or football teams fielded from 1A schools, the, the, the smaller schools in the state of Colorado versus 5A, because the pool we're selecting from and the level of competition, right, and the, and the skills associated with those are different because of those levels of competition. So even in beef cattle breeding, we're worried about level of competition. So there's a considerable amount of science that goes behind selecting the right breeding animals. But ultimately it becomes, what do we want to improve? What are the characteristics about our animals that we want to improve so that in the next generation, when the babies are born, we expect them to be superior to what their parents were and do that consistently over generations to make improvement. So, uh, you know, things we're interested in is adaptability to the environment. Uh, those of you in Colorado, well, I guess much of, much of the nation a couple of weeks ago uh, would have been exposed to that cold snap where here in Colorado it was uh, well below zero. Well, cattle that were adapted to those type of temperatures would not do well in maybe the Gulf Coast region of the United States. So things we want to improve are often environment dependent. Where are those animals living and uh, who is raising those? And that might determine what we actually want to improve. And when the, the Gulf states where it's uh, more humid and, and considerably hotter than here, we want heat tolerance. In this region and north, we want cold tolerance. So how do we select for that? 
you know, I recently read some articles on nitrogen excretion. It turns out there's actually a genetic component to how much nitrogen uh, an animal puts out in its waste. And so we could actually select for that if we wanted to reduce nitrogen loading. The other, some of the other characteristics we like to select for are economic sustainability. I, you know, in, in the people I work with, the cattle breeders, genetic improvement takes such a long time. Everybody enters that business with the idea that it's long term. And so obviously making a living out of that uh, uh, endeavor is important. So we may want to select for meat or milk quality traits or uh, traits that are associated with value and uh, or costs of production. And then ultimately, more recently, we've been able to make advances in how we select animals for health and longevity. Now, there's some evidence now that we can select animals whose progeny won't get sick as often. And if they don't get sick as often, maybe we can reduce the use of antibiotics to treat those animals because they're healthier to start with. There's also evidence that we can select animals so that the next generation has a longer lifespan than the current generation. And longevity is one of the key factors that's a consider, uh, consideration for most of our, our cattle breeders. So ultimately it becomes, it, it's ranch dependent almost and farm dependent. What are the things that we want to improve? Okay. And then ultimately they need tools to decide what's genetically best. You now here we've, we've, we've got a picture of a, a particular uh, bull calf with its mother right behind it. How do we know what that bull would contribute to the next generation as far as genetics. And is that an animal we want to use in our breeding program? Okay, so really breeders, the ranchers and the farmers need tools to determine, is this something I want to contribute genetics to the next generation or is it not? But then the question becomes, well, well what tools would they like to have or what tools do they use to make uh, genetic improvement and, and select the right animals to become the parents? Well, if you look historically, the, like I started the discussion, we have lots of historical information and pedigrees on uh, from, from breeders with millions of records over time. And uh, for instance, the American Angus Association, um, as you drive across the countryside and you see uh, black cattle, most of those are gonna be, have some Angus influence. They were formed in 1883 and uh, is one of the longer, so longer lived associations in the country and all of their breeders take measurements on their animals and send them into the association. They, they validate pedigrees and send that information in and they take various measures on those animals to contribute to the overall betterment of the population. And now in recent times, we've actually got genetic maps. And a lot of this spun out of, uh, of uh, uh, all of the work with the human genome and essentially, uh, for any of you that have done 23andMe or man, maybe, maybe the ancestry tests, we can do that now with cattle. And you can take a blood sample or maybe a tissue sample or, or some hair and send that in and, and get a, a scan for what uh, DNA sequences that animal has. And then we can associate that with this genetic map and pick locations on chromosomes that are associated with things we think are important that the next generation be able to do. And, I, and, and this is just an example. I pulled this out uh, relative. I think it's uh, 770,000 locations on the bovine chromosome and each dot represents a change in a base. And there are certain regions that are associated, in this case, it with, is with a disease trait that has to do with adaptability. So animals are either more resistant or more susceptible to that. And so how do we select the animals that have a higher degree of resistance and are less likely to uh, be afflicted by that disease. Okay, so you can see we there's a plethora of data on individuals both from now through the genomic information, the genetic map, and historically through pedigrees and measures that uh, cattle producers still take today. Uh, in Colorado, it's if you drive across the countryside, you're going to start seeing a lot of baby calves. And most of those calves will have had a birth weight taken from the, from the, the purebred breeders. But really, ultimately, how do the calculations work? How do we assimilate all of this information to enable the farmers and ranchers to make a good, de good decision on which cow or which bull they want to use to produce the next generation? So bear with me because I'm going to flash you back to eighth grade algebra, or maybe it was your high school algebra. And if you remember back to that time, 
where you had three equations, three unknowns, and we had to solve for X, Y, and Z. Or maybe it was two equations, two unknowns, and uh, how painful that was. Well, in cattle, when we have millions of animals in our records, we have millions of equations, millions of unknowns, and we know the relationship between every individual and every other individual, the genetic relationship, right? Between all of the individuals, we incorporate that and use, obviously, a fair bit of computing power to actually calculate genetic information about the genetics of every individual in that database. And so ultimately what becomes with, of that is we have a catalog where you can go through and thumb through and figure out which bull you might want to use in your breeding program. And that's information that's available for you to look at, read about the animal and make a selection decision. And we can use these evaluations to predict the average of what the future will hold and make predictions about what is the genetic merit? Are these animals gonna be on target for what I need to have a longer lifespan or meet the consumer, uh, make our consumers and our customers more happy with the product? We have that capability. And ultimately, we have tools for the individual rancher and farmer. And so what I wanna do right now is pull out an example. So this is coming from the bottom left side and we're gonna delve into this a bit so that I can at least illustrate some of the, the, the complexities associated with cattle breeding. So I'm gonna pull this section out. And what I've done is, is, uh, is worked with a group uh, whose headquarters is actually in Denver and pulled out three potential males that you might want to use in your breeding program. And if you look at this, there's a lot of information. And sometimes I just get overwhelmed with how much data that a farmer and rancher would have to use or could use to make a good breeding decision. And so I just wanna go through two examples, okay? One of the things we often worry about during calving season, which is, is starting now, is whether uh, as that mother and that fetus get close to giving, she gets close to giving birth, going into labor, and we have what we call parturition, right? What is the probability or that we're going to have to help that mother deliver the calf? And obviously we want something that's born unassisted because there's a lot less stress on everybody. And that's really the goal. So we can evaluate what we call calving ease direct and select a, select a bull that has a higher prob probability of his sons and daughters being born naturally without assistance. Or maybe we're into uh, marketing a local beef product to local restaurants. Uh, maybe when we get back face to face and, and we have uh, more 100% open restaurants, right? And those of you who are interested in eating a high quality steak, one of the things that makes a steak a pleasant eating experience is the amount of fat that is in the muscle. It's fat adds, when it's cooking, adds juiciness, adds a lot of our flavor. So you could select a sire that's gonna produce a product, a steak that is more palatable or gives a better eating experience to the customer. So there's a whole host of information that we can actually use to make good breeding decisions and try to select the right animals for our breeding program. Okay? So that's one of the keys associated with this right, is how do we give those farmers and ranchers that are out there taking care of the cattle when breeding season comes up here in about three months, how do we allow them or give them a tool to select the right animals, knowing what their animals are subject to as far as an environment and how they're gonna market their product. Another advancement that has really changed the beef cattle uh, breeding uh, industries is the ability to freeze and preserve semen this was originally developed in the 1940s. And I believe uh, at a local USDA facility, uh, the director, they, they store uh, semen or germplasm uh, as, a, as a repository or a gene bank, essentially, if you would. And the oldest they have stored was on a bull that was born in 1943. Okay? And we've done research, they've done research, looking about how viable is that semen over time as it ages? And they found that semen collected in the 1960s has similar viability. The ability to uh, create offspring is, as semen stored less than 20 years. Okay? So why is that important? Well, if you think about the challenges we have as uh, uh, our environments change, and our consumer preferences change and what we need to emphasize, we may have animals that were born here in 2018 that we could select from, but now 
with this technology and the ability to store the semen and germplasm and, and in some cases embryos, right? We could go back and decide maybe there's an animal from the 1950s analogous to an heirloom plant vi variety that really would be more appropriate in today's environment and customer demands. Or maybe as animals change, uh, we've inadvertently increased the, the, the susceptibility to different diseases. Well, maybe those older animals can contribute some ability to uh, reduce some of the incidence of those diseases. So the ability to store semen long term has really changed the way we look at breeding programs and how we make genetic improvement and the, and the genetic material that you can actually access. But ultimately, it's up to the individual farmer or rancher to decide what's best for their particular program and their particular environment, given the environmental challenges that we have so that they can develop better animals that better fit that program. Okay? And we know that markets and environments change. And so, you know, heaven forbid that, that, that someday we have uh, are challenged by uh, an animal pandemic that could be have a, a severe degree of lethality. Right. We may have to go back to some of that information and some of that germplasm to recreate populations and the diversity that we need in those populations. So it's really enabled uh, cattle breeders uh, to look long term. And also uh, the science behind that has allowed cattle breeders to um, select the right animals to produce the next generation. And if you look in this, you think about this, in the end, what we do is, is we're deciding which bull goes with which cow. We're essentially, essentially a data-driven matchmaking service for cattle. Everyone's bringing their pun game to uh, I'm in so much heaven right now. <laughs> it's moving. It's moving for me. <laughs> oh, that was great. Thank you so much, Mark. Let's, let's get started with the Q&A. Now is the time, although you've already been doing it and doing a wonderful job of typing your questions in the live chat box. So we're going to bring back Alaris and Mark, and they will take your questions on both topics at the same time. At the same time. We encourage you to draw connections. I don't think it's going to be too hard. It turns out the cattle breeding and the 100-year starship are basically the same thing. Who had any idea? We're going to celebrate all your connections tonight with this, Charlie. The gong. And we're going to give a very special prize tonight to the person who asks the question that makes the best connection. So get your, uh, get your questions out and submit them through the live chat now. We'll bring our speakers back and get started. All right, welcome back, Alirez. Welcome back, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. Are you ready for this? I'm watching these comments go by. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We've got a good audience. We've got good questions. Charlie, do you want to kick it off? Do you want me to? Uh, you you have the one that you want to start with, I think. So go ahead. I do, I do. I, I'm going to read it out loud while I try to find it, pulling it up, because you all have been such a, a great audience. Uh, Karen Bennett asks, would cows for food in space be realistic? And part two, it's a two-part question. Do scientists see vegan diet, or do scientists see that a vegan diet in space travel might be necessary? I'm going to try to pull that up, uh, but I've got it in the... Good connection, good question. So I'll go ahead and start with that one. Um, actually taking the cows into space would not, at least given current technologies and our current capabilities, would not be realistic. Just because you have to feed them, you have to warm, what do you do with the waste? What do you do with all parts of the cow? Um, just waste in the air and the filtration systems. Animals in general are not the best choice. Now, if we get into freeze-dried food, how long does that last? And we're talking a multi-generational ship. So we're, that's why we talk about closed loop food systems. Are we ready to eat everything with that? And then, you know, going back to the genetic engineering, are we gonna engineer maybe baby cows? Or can, there are some scientists who have made um, artificial meat so that might be something that we could bring the pro get the protein 
that we need. Yes, you can go vegan, but in long-term um, non, well, we don't know how we'll look at keeping that human body and the um, your muscles strong, but we'll see. But in general, it's not wise to take animals with us. That's too bad. I love animals. <laughs> we can have virtual animals. Oh. Uh, what's, what's, gonna, what's gonna humanity be without our pets? The, yeah. The, uh, I look if we could put twelve hundred people in and, and cattle are, you know, can we can we take enough food to last a hundred years or do we have to produce it somehow? Because cattle are great consumers of byproducts resulting from from making our food products. Or you know, going back to our Q and A uh, on the brews, if you brew anything, there's spent grain that humans can't eat. So what are we going to do with that in a hundred years? Well, yeah. the thing is, the journey is seventy thousand years, not a hundred. Seventy thousand, even worse. <laughs> yeah, we'll figure out something to do. Yeah. With that, trust. So here's another question, sort of building on that, that I think is a, a wonderful crossover question from Susie. How can what we know about cattle breeding aid us in planning for the 100 year starship? I'd be curious to hear what both of you think. Um, genetic engineering, you know, understanding what that is and breeding. How do you, well, I was writing, you know, freezing semen and eggs. It's going to be necessary as we go, as the humans evolve, because maybe fourth generation, they may not look like us. They're going to look very different. And do we bring in these eggs that look like our original human self versus our different human self that's going to evolve? And can those future women or maybe we just have artificial birth and bring in the old humans to mingle with the new ones? Yeah, what happens when uh, if you start with a small group on that spaceship? You know, generation after generation, you're becoming more related to each other without the ability to uh, bring in some diversity. Well, you have 1,200 we're starting with. So, and that, that's probably going to be the capacity of the ship. So hopefully, they'll, it depends on who you breed with, which is your point. We could say we're going to bring in genetic material from people on Earth to breed with the people who are already there and create that diversity. And then if you do artificial birth, then you could just mix and match and genetically engineer, because I'm sure we're gonna have advanced technology to do that. So it's it's gonna be interesting, really yeah, about interesting. fourth and fifth, fourth and fifth generation of what those humans will look like and how we decide to create children. Is it gonna be artificial or natural? So we've got a lot of questions that kind of build on these ideas. People are asking uh, lots of different things. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to pull up one that's kind of oddly specific as a, as a next place to ref, riff on. This is one is from Dina Doherty and she asks, will now it gets very small when it comes <laughs> up on my screen, will breeding selection be used in the colonies <laughs> in order to reduce the methane gas released by humans to maintain healthy air quality levels in space? Yeah. I'm gonna let you take that one first. One. <laughs> Got methane in both groups, cattle and and otherwise, <laughs> and something has to happen with it. And uh, on the beef cattle side, uh, there is work in looking at, you know, all ruminants produce methane. It doesn't matter whether, whether you're a, a buffalo, a cow, a camel, a giraffe, every anything that has a has a, a rumen produces methane, and so. Uh, uh, we even produce methane without the rumen, but uh, uh, there is research in how how can we reduce the emissions of individual animals? Maybe that's applicable elsewhere. Well, here's the thing. I'm I'm going to say something that um, we all know here. So basically, what you just said is everybody farts, just like everybody poops. And I specifically asked this question of an astronaut. Um, the astronaut that spent a year in space, I happened to be on a panel with him when I first started with 100 Year Starship. And the one question I wanted to know, because I knew what the answer was, is, is space stinky? You cannot open a window in space. You cannot let in fresh air. You better hope those filtration systems work in year 20. 
in year 50, things like that, because there's nowhere for the, the methane to go or the odor to go. So I know when they have those exchanges of the astronauts are like, can we get a little bit of that fresh air before <laughs> before you go, before you close it off? Because there is no place. So it is um, stale air because it's re everything is recycled. So we def that is one of the capabilities we want to do is like, how do you maintain a fresh filtration system over generations? So you've gone into a house that's, you know, a very long time. So yeah, it's, uh, we, we definitely have to find air filtration systems because everyone has outgoing things. It's stale air for the first generation, but for the second generation, <laughs> it's just the way it is. Like, it Point taken, they don't know. <laughs> but they're gonna hear people complaining about it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, here's a here's a great question from friends of the show, Detlink Bloom. Both the 100-year starship and cattle breeding focus on the future, the long term, the next generation. But does this focus on the future distract us from the problems of the present? Great question. Yeah. I'd love to hear your responses. I'm saying no, because it, it does not distract from the problems of the present because and this is a, a, a foundational tenet of 100-year starship, whatever we develop in order to solve those problems in space apply here on Earth. So if we're looking at um, finding ways genetically to reduce disease in cattle, guess what? Or that we're trying to say, you know, when we on the ship in the third generation, we're trying to reduce some kind of factor around that. What that is, is we apply that here on earth today because now that can help some child who's ill, who we're trying to understand what's making them ill and we can do that. We can get really, you know, we can talk about if we understand that from a genetic perspective, if we are doing artificial insemination, guess what? We can look for those genes and take them out now before a child is born. You know, that's the rosy picture of that. But yeah, anything that we have to solve for in the future, we can apply here today. What, what I like to say is because it's such a, you know, a far flung thing and it's a great challenge, you're more likely to attract people to solve that problem. And then we have people say, okay, thank you. And let's apply it right now. I would echo that. Sometimes looking forward and thinking about how do we prepare ourselves to solve that future helps us develop a better solution for what's gonna happen next year or in cattle generations in the next six years. Thank you. All right, I've got a question that gets to some of the ethics of, of both cattle breeding and the 100 year starship. This one's from Emily. She asks, who ultimately gets to decide which traits are valuable and who is eligible to pass along their genetic material? I can answer that in cattle. Perfect. It's, it's the person who's <laughs> well, here is here. Yeah. Good luck on the next part. There. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. I'm gonna, buy, I'm gonna buy you some time. Thank you. Uh, so it's it's the person who's who's caring for those and, and gets to decide uh, what traits are important. And realistically, ultimately in cattle, it's the consumer. It's the people going to the grocery store. And the producer's more worried about what happens on their farm, but ultimately that's eventually where the genetics goes. Ooh, that's such a loaded question. Um, <laughs> it depends. I like what you said is who's caring for them. Well, who's caring for the ship and what's the purpose of that ship? The first ship is pure survival. Who can survive? Who has the genetic um, wherewithal to survive the conditions? Because really we're looking at conditions. So I think there was someone in the chat earlier said, you know, the that first ship is going to be pissed because just like when you're buying a phone, do you wait till the next come the next one comes out because it's going to have better technology or whatever? Do you buy now? It's called the weight factor, and we had someone talk about that at hundred year starship. So we send off the first ship. That second ship is going to have better technology. It's going to move faster in a different crew going to pass that first ship and they're going to be pissed. Yeah. So the, the, that's just a little side thing. But the point is, it depends on where we are in time, what goes and um, what we need for survival on that ship. It's going to be skill based. It's going to be survivability. But 
in general, if you get people like that from across the globe, it then decides who does get to go. That becomes a societal issue. Because the people who stay may feel like, oh, we're not good enough to go. What are we, it's like that FOMO. What are we missing out on? You know, because they're going to a new planet, a new home, but guess what? They don't real, people may not realize that those people who they see go are never gonna get there, theoretically. So who gets to go is a big social issue as well as survivability. So once you, you, you take out all the, the physical survivability piece, then it's a, it becomes political and societal who gets to go. And that was one of the things I used to say in decision theory is what are the values that you're taking along? Just like in, in, in cattle, when you're looking for different features, and you know docility, I think that was some someone brought yep, that up. Yep. Um, that's a personality trait. Do you want to start to breed in personality traits into humans, which you can? Here's a family of people who are very outgoing, very athletic. Do you want that type of person? The people who can survive in space in long term. We've all just gone through COVID. Who's come looking at this one year later? Who are the people who seem most adapted to that. Those are the people that we would probably select to go on the ship. Not that the other other people can't survive, but these people survived COVID and were like, hey, that, just a different party place <laughs> right here. You know, that, that kind of thing. So those are the things we think about and it really is, um, it gets to be beyond just the basic question. It becomes a societal and a political question. Once again. <laughs> This is just a party place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just a new party place for the extra right. Right? right? You got to find a place to go. <laughs> I mean, I go back to my original sentiment. I, I'm kind of fond of this planet. I, I, I'm, I'll be happy to, uh, to, to volunteer to stay back. <laughs> and you know what? We have to preserve because the majority of our species is still going to be here. That was one of the things that blew me away with 100 Year Starship. Our species, all of us, Homo sapiens, whatever our iteration is now, is going to be here. We're going to evolve here. We have a symbiotic relationship with Earth, and we're trying to recreate that relationship on this vehicle. And that's because that's what that how is how we survive. And when we evolve that symbiotic relationship, we're we're basically creating another branch of human evolution. When you send that ship off, we don't know what's going to happen, and those people who make it there are going to be so different than humans now, it's like, you know, Neanderthal, I was gonna say Neanderthal, but that's not that far behind us. A couple of people before that, Lucy wow. versus us. That and now we have sense. us versus what, you know, um, Lucy's gonna be in the future. See what I mean, Charlie? Cattle breeding and one of the 100 years starship, they're exactly the same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We really messed up by putting them together. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, thank you so much, Alaris. Thank you, Mark. That was <laughs> truly mind blowing. But now, Happy to be here. now it's prize time. Woohoo! Prize, prize time. time. Each week, we give a very special prize to the person who asks the best question. And how do we choose the best question? Well, we don't. A DCPA social media manager, Austin Walker, chooses his favorite question. And he's determined or who's going to win tonight's prize. And what is that prize, Charlie? Tonight's prize is two free season passes to this summer's Mixed Taste series. That's right. Ooh. We'll definitely be bringing you a full summer lineup of Mixed Taste Wednesday nights in July and August and you can win free two, two free passes for the summer. Uh, and they'll either be in person in the Sewell Ballroom or live streaming, whatever you prefer or whatever health allows. Uh, so stay tuned for more information coming later this spring or early summer at denvercenter.org. All right. Well, the winner tonight for the best co connection is Dina Doherty. Dina asks, will breeding selection be used in the colonies in order to reduce the methane gas released by humans or to main health, health, maintain healthy air levels in space? So thank you, Dina. A wonderful question. Um, congratulations. Please email offcenter at dcpa.org to arrange your prize. All right. Well, before we pass the mic over to our poet this evening, we are thrilled to welcome back our first ever guest curator for Mixed Taste. We thought it would be fun this season, and we invited Adrian Miller to come up with ideas for topics and speakers for this series. 
Uh, for those who don't know him, Adrian Miller is a politician, author, food historian, a longtime friend of mixed taste, and decorated mixed taste speaker. Let's welcome Adrian Miller. Hello, Adrian. Adrian. What's up, y'all? Great program tonight. Thanks Thank to you. you. It was yeah. awesome. Thanks for all your recommendations. What a cool, what a cool topic you cool topics you suggested. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, you go ahead. Yeah. No, it was just an honor to be the first guest curator and um you know, some of my friends have been involved in this season, so it was good to see them in action and introduce them to this great uh, series. And, you know, people ask me what fuels me, and I just tell people, I'm a curious guy with an appetite. I just choose to write about food, but I, I love this series because we just delve into so many different topics. So cool. yeah, that's great. And it did come back to food tonight in, a, in many ways, in a couple of different ways, uh, which brings us to Friday. What are we doing Friday, Adrian? So Friday, we're going to have a virtual fish fry. And uh, it's a time where we're gonna come together and just reflect on this uh, season. And then I'm gonna reveal the theme. So all of you who have watched all of the, um, the sessions that we've had this year, uh, this winter, um, you'll notice that there's a theme. It may not seem apparent, but I'm gonna unveil that. That's awesome. And uh, it's a BYO fish fry. Right, so um, basically I'm gonna recommend you, you get your fish at, you can go to Welton Street Cafe, you can go to Randall's, you can go to Swerks in Aurora. You could go to Hungry Wolf Barbecue, uh, kind of uh, Havana Yell. And I think we're gonna have this these posted someplace, right? So people can check yep. them out. Yeah. Um, so the fish fry is available to uh, bundle buyers, people who bought all three of the mixed tastes this time. And you'll receive an email uh, reminding you about the event, giving you the special link for Friday and with links to all of Adrian's recommendations for where to get food some of which you can order to be delivered and some of which you need to go pick up. Yep. All is delicious. Yeah. Well, we're very much looking forward to that fish fry uh, on Friday with you, Adrian. It should be a lot of fun. Yep, should but, be very soulful. So looking forward to it. I am too. All right, now let's invite Susie Q back to enlighten us with an original poem inspired by tonight's talks. Susie Q Smith is an award-winning artist, an activist and an educator. Please welcome Susie Q. Good evening, and everyone. I've titled this poem, Mixed Taste Poem, 100 Year Starship and Cattle Breeding, March 2nd, 2021. My favorite planet is a speck of dust, hurling itself in a spiral galaxy shaped something like a strand of my hair or DNA. And speaking of genetics, who makes the next generation or more specifically, who creates the future? Of course, we must choose our champions as we build an inclusive, audacious journey, a lifetime, generations who were left out of the conversation, and the generation after that, and the generation after that. Alone, we can dream of stars. Together, we can be on stars. We look up and discover a future and a past we remember duskly. Sirius B whispering the names of our ancestors and the echoes of Canopus telling them when to plant. We lean into the science to keep us from flirting with stagnation. Be honest, I know more about astrology than light years. Introduce myself as a Capricorn, Sagittarius rising, Leo moon, which my daughter says are all the worst ones, but I am willing to learn. It takes 36 years to escape the sun's halo, and I'm older than that now. Still flex and stretch my imagination to keep from atrophy. Of course, space currency will be skills sweat equity, and we will need writers, and we will need sweepers to contribute to the betterment of the population. We know that markets change, that we may need to thaw the past to create the future, designing a new breed. When the babies are born, we expect them to be better than their parents. So we must consider who knows life, or bodies, or breeding, who owns them and their future, who knows longevity, or death, or fertilizer. Maybe left to our own devices, we would drift indefinite. So it might take artificial gravity, pressing bodies together to make life livable, beyond just survivable. We come to each other. We come to the table in ritual. This morning, my students asked me, Miss, would you ever want to go to space? Of course, I answered. Of course, I am a poet after all, and so naturally in love with the moon. Thank you, Susie. I love the line, we lean into the science to keep us from
from flirting with stagnation. Wow. Awesome. That's very nice. Uh, Susie is a longtime mixed taste poet and always puts a wonderful punctuation mark on the evening. So thank you all again for watching tonight. If you enjoyed tonight's program and you have the means, please consider making a donation to the DCPA and MCA Denver at dcpa.today slash mixed taste. Your support helps our two organizations continue to bring you great programming like this as we all eagerly await being able to be together in person again. So thank you for your generosity. And thank you to our presenting sponsor, Blue Room. Blue Room is a private investment company born of invention, forward thought, and hope. Through best-in-class investing, they create space to amplify the power of human togetherism. Togetherism means together we can accomplish anything. Well, let's bring everyone back to say goodnight. Thank you, Aliris, Mark, Susie Q, Adrian. And finally, thanks to you, our virtual audience, for your excellent questions, your super excellent puns, and your socially distant engagement. Uh, we hope to see many of you at the virtual fish fry on Friday, and we look forward to mixing it up again this summer. Thank you, everyone, and good night. Thank you.